Hey, hey, I'm Sonia Richards Ross, and I'm a guest on season four of Nothing to Lose But Yourself, hosted with Ricky Day. Well, y'all, I'm excited. It is season four, and my guest today is another reason I'm excited. She is a four-time Olympic gold medalist in track and field, a six-time world champion. She holds the 400-meter record, American record, that is. Uh, she's a three-time author. She's the founder and co-owner of Mommy Nation. She's a sports analyst and commentator for NBC, and she was a TV host. And if that's not enough, she is one of the housewives on the Housewives. Real Housewives of Atlanta. Who am I talking about? You guys know. Welcome to the podcast, Sonia Richards Ross. What's going on? How are you? I'm well, Ricky. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that very thorough introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome. Thank you for joining us. We are really thrilled to have you. Uh, and it's funny, my friends are laughing, the ones that know about this, because they know I'm not a huge fan of reality shows. They're like, wait, well, you're doing what? I'm like, gee, it's so much more than that. So not that it's <laughs> exactly. So welcome to the podcast. And to that end, how, how's everything going with you? How's life? How's Ross? How's Deuce? How's everybody? Yeah, everything is good. You know, we are now, we've been in Atlanta now almost two years, and it's been such a good move for us, for our family. Um, Deuce is thriving in school. I love the diversity of this community. Everyone has just been so warm and just has accepted us, and it's just been really great. So I'm a happy wife, happy mom, and just, you know, work is going well, too. That's good. Good stuff. Glad to hear it, particularly in these times we live in. It's like you can't take any of it for granted. So yeah, uh, we are happy for you. Yeah. We talked about Housewives real briefly. I mean, let's just dive right into that. Like are you excited about season four? I mean, the premiere is happening when this conversation drops at the same. You're the premiere guest yeah. on here and we're premiering the new season. Are you guys excited about the season? Anything? We, you can give us a little scoop on anything that's coming. <laughs> Well, I am super excited. So this is going to be my sophomore season, but the 15th season of The Real Housewives of Atlanta. And, you know, this season is really, really amazing. I felt like we filmed two seasons in one. It was just so much happening. And I think what made this season even better than last is that last season kind of felt like a rebuild a year for the franchise. You know, like it was my first season. Drew was on for her second season. A lot of the big names had left the franchise. And so... You know, I feel like this season we become real friends and there's we are like it's real skin in the game. And, you know, it's just it just feels very authentic and real, as you see, I think, very dynamic women, strong willed boss women really trying to navigate, you know, new friendships and, and sisterhood um, and, and family and relationships and new guys and just <laughs> all the things. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And so, you know, I just actually saw the first episode and I'm really excited. It's a super sized episode and it's really good. Um, so I can't wait for the fans to see it and, you know, and see the growth of the group, you know, because I think there's a lot there. Yeah, that's that's, that's dope. Well, I'm, I'm excited for you. Uh, Thank you. I am becoming, you know, I, I do a deep dive on my research. So I had to <laughs> I had to watch an entire season. Do my friends know me. Any season? Yeah. Yeah. Respect. I respect that. Just, just I respect that. Like, you know, I do some journalism too, some broadcasting, and I know mm -hmm. it's not easy always doing the research on folks. And for you to go back and watch the entire season, I really respect that. <laughs> you I appreciate you. Uh and, and respect is the word of the day because as as my friends will share, I, I'm just I'm not a reality show fan. I got my reasons for that. It'll come up in the conversation a little bit, but I respect, you know, everybody doing what they do and the reasons why they do it or whatever. And so um and it was good to watch it because it reminded me to check myself and not get in my head about what I thought of something or whether it's worthy or not or what, because people have yeah. reasons for doing the things they're doing. People are telling, you know, in some cases, some really compelling human stories. And I was reminded of that on wa watching the season. So it, it was good for me too. It, it brought me down a notch or two and made me uh, <laughs> appreciate it uh, for what it is. Now, I know you are a proud Jamaican woman. I'm Jamaican by relationship myself now and more on that another time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, tell me a little bit, uh, you know, just for those who may not know, tell me a little bit about where you grew up and, and your family and your childhood and, and how, how your parents poured into you. Yeah, um, so I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, um, in a two parent household, my sister and I. And, you know, I just have the fondest memories of my childhood in Jamaica. Um, track and field is the biggest sport there. And I remember at the age of seven, you know, or age of nine, riding for my uh, class assignment that I would be an Olympic champion. 
And so, you know, I always say I got the best of both worlds because I had this wonderful foundation set being in Jamaica in a place where track was so popular with great coaching and great inspiration. Um, and then my family migrated to the United States when I was 12 and I was able to continue, you know, on this journey towards becoming an Olympic champion in track and field. And so, you know, I'm very, 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 very blessed. Um, my, my family, my mom, my dad made so many sacrifices uh, for me to be able to live this dream. And as a parent myself now, I don't take that for granted. Like going to track meets every day, staying up all night. They converted their garage to a gym. My mom became a trainer. My dad and mom traveled the world with me. It was just all the things to allow me to live this dream. So, you know, I, I feel like my childhood was incredible. Um, and it's, you know, very few people get to say that they said they would do something when they were nine and they actually did it 20 years later. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a dream come true. And I still, I still take a lot of the lessons I learned from sports into all the things that I do. Um, because I, I do think that sports was definitely my greatest life teacher. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's good. That's good stuff. And you know, what jumps out at me is it's such a beautiful example of the importance of parenting and and being in your children's lives and all the ways that they require and and what it really yeah. means to to love somebody um you know this the theme of this season of the podcast is for love and blackness um Ooh, and i love and, that well absolutely thank you uh because the podcast fundamentally is about what it means right to show up as your authentic self and to love your authentic self and what that does in the world uh and what happens when people don't love themselves who don't know who they are because that causes them to lash out at others uh in an effort to make themselves feel better but this season, I really want to focus on love and, and blackness, because I think anti-blackness is really kind of destroying the world uh, in many ways. And we've lost the love ethic and all that we do. And, and part of loving people is providing care and affection, of course, but it's also pouring into people and, and supporting them in their dreams. It's helping people and nurturing people into fullness spiritually. And your parents, you know, they sound like they did that. And, and not only from your words, but from who you've shown up in life as. I mean, would you say that's a valid statement. I mean, how yes. grateful are you to them and tell them about that right now? Cause we're going to share this with them. Yeah. And you know, the other thing too, that you, that you said is like, when I reflect on my career and I mm -hmm. reflect on, you know, what made the difference, because when I went to the university of Texas on a full scholarship, there were a lot of young women who had the potential to be Olympic champions or to make it to the Olympics or go on to do great things. And I always say the thing that I think lifted me above the rest was the love that my parents poured into me, like mm -hmm. just point blank, like the love that they poured into me gave me the confidence that I needed to go on and to excel. It, um, it held me when I faced disappointments and, mm -hmm. you know, failures and defeat. And so I definitely think that there is no like magical formula to creating, you know, um, great children, but I certainly feel like the one thing that you know guarantees them to become the best version of themselves is just giving them that unconditional love um yeah. and so you know i'm just so grateful for my parents for being such a good example of that like you know like i had some tough times and they were always there i had great times and they were there and it's just you know just the love was just undeniable you know so yeah i'm great i'm so grateful to them and i you know i hope to be that for my son too Oh, that, that's amazing. And, and and people listening understand that it's not about a, a a perfect world or a perfect family. I mean, I grew up in essentially a single family household, uh, although I have a great relationship with my father as well as my mother. But, you know, it's essentially a single family household and, and, and meager upbringing in terms of material things. But again, I always felt safe. I always felt loved. And there's no substitute for that. So much of that is who I am as a human being uh today so uh, that's 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 amazing and, and kudos to your parents who are also on the show uh yeah. with you. you guys all living together you're close-knit group looks like it might be uh you might be changing that in second in this next season soon, but stay tuned <laughs> uh okay I'm, you guys i'm gonna try my best to get a scoop out of here during this conversation <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I want to talk about that a little bit, though. Clearly, you're doing a reality show um, has its challenges. Right. And I want to get into that a little bit. Um, but here's my question. Um, it's fraught at best to do a show like Housewives unless or until you know who you are at your core. And, you know, we know what you do and we know what you've done for a living. But at your core, who is Sandra Richards Ross? Who are you? Ooh, these are the kinds of questions I like, Ricky. Deep, deep. <laughs> they didn't warn you? <laughs> this is what we do. They didn't warn me. 
for me, man. Um, but I love it. I, I, I absolutely love it. You know, I am at the core um, just a very loving being who aspires to um, exude Black excellence, Black love. Um, I, I, I'm a person who understands that um, although we strive for perfection and excellence, you know, without, you know, my truth, without walking with God, we all fall short constantly. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's about leaning into God and knowing that everything that comes to me is a blessing and a gift from him. Um, even my husband, even my family, like, you know, like they're just borrowed, you know, they're all gods and um, I'm very grateful for them. Um, and so ultimately, I just want to bring a little light uh, wherever I can into the world. Um, and like I said, ultimately reflect Black love and Black excellence um, everywhere I go. Yeah, no, I, that's a powerful answer. And I'm not surprised. And that, that's a good one. And I, I had this question I wanted to ask you a little later, but you segue right into it. So I'm going to ask you now, um, you know, when I went to Jamaica for the first time, it was the first time I had gone to an all black country, essentially. Yeah. Uh, and it was eye opening. It was amazing. Um, it, it was just it was a great experience. And as an African American, uh, you know, we have a very different kind of experience in our lives, right? right? And so I realized when I went to Jamaica and from my friends who come from Africa, no one even knows what blackness is until they come to quote unquote, the global West or the global North uh, America or Europe. That's when you find out that there's this thing called blackness. What does blackness mean to you? And what did your parents kind of teach you about it? Because I would imagine their sense of blackness is very different than the average African-Americans. And I'm very curious about that, how that and how that plays into who you are as a person. Yeah, that's an exceptional question once again. And, you know, I am also, you know, acutely aware of um, how different it is to grow up in uh, a country that is all black, where all you see around you are black people, uh, you know, doing great things or not maximizing, you know, their, you know, all of who they are. Mm -hmm. Um, And I, I never, I'll never forget, you know, like you said, like coming to the States and the older I got realizing like, oh, wait a minute, like this is a thing, like being black, you know, is, is, is a thing outside of just who we are, right? Like the, the I think for me, my blackness was always, it, 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 how can I describe this in a way that will resonate? So I, I guess for me, everyone who I admired and wanted to be like and inspired to be was black. And so black for me was excellence. Like it was, you know, the sky's the limit. It was all the opportunities, all of those things. And then when I migrated to the States and obviously I started to integrate in different uh, communities where there were a a lot of white people and all different kinds of people. At first I didn't even, I didn't even notice it. Right. Like I was just moving like, like normal. And Mm -hmm. then you start to kind of get beat down by the narratives that, you know, unfortunately is a reality, especially for black girls in America, right? Where we're not the beauty standard, we're not the highest paid, we're not all of these different things. However, because it was so ingrained in me that black is excellence and we can be all of the things, you know, I still just feel like I walk with this confidence of knowing who I am and whose I am and where I came from and all the great things that we could do that I feel like I always kind of had an edge. (laughs) You know, um, that um, that I hope to as well, like wrong, like my husband is very much into black history and culture and he's all about like learning about who he is and, you know, the power of his ancestors and all the things that we can be. And so we're both really acutely aware of empowering our son um, to understand that the skin that he wears is he should be so proud of it and the possibilities are endless because of it. Um, but but Ricky, you're right. There is definitely it's something so unique and special to learning about who you are at a young age in a place where all you see around you are other people that look like you. Um, And it gives you, you know, it gives you an inner confidence that's hard to shake. Um, And I I really do wish that, um, you know, young people born in America had that experience too, because I sometimes can see how this country can just beat us down and make Mm -hmm. us feel like, you know, we can't achieve all of these great things or our circumstances are so trying that is, you know, it feels almost impossible to get out of. And so, you know, I think it's a very deep question. These are conversations we have in the house, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> rarely publicly on podcasts. So I'm thrilled to have this conversation. But 
yeah, my blackness brings me a lot of pride. Um, and I feel very confident as a black woman that I can do anything I put my mind to and that I'm mm. equipped to, you know, to take over the world. <laughs> I received that and I see that. Um, and you're right. We have these conversations in the background, but I think now more than ever, we have to have these conversations publicly because uh, this myth of supremacy and this rampant yeah. anti-blackness is destroying everything. And not just us, by the way, we're on the verge of destroying what's left of our democracy all because of anti-blackness. When you really think about it, anti-blackness is as bad for those who aren't black as it is for us. And that's what I'm really focused on, hope, helping people to see that. Like anti-blackness is destroying everything, including the things you say you hold near and dear. Um, you know, for instance, um, last week I was um, walking along the, the river here in New York and, and I discovered I discovered this new river. And so I named it the, uh, the uh, Nothing to Lose River. And it's a beautiful <laughs> river. Um, you get where I'm going, right? You know, you how do you discover things when there's people there already? Like all this stuff, all this stuff are these rampant lies and the lies are not helping anybody. Just stop the madness. Like it's not CRT. It's not like this, this, this heinous, uh, you know, conspiracy to destroy everything. It's just the freaking truth. Like, it's okay. We're all human beings. You know what I mean? And so if you remove this, this construct of race side of things, you give people the space to be who we actually are, which is human beings. Yeah. trying to figure out our way, trying to love ourselves, trying to grow, trying to achieve, trying to make this life mean something. I, I just think everybody robs themselves of that when they're trying to rob others of that. They're actually the most damage they're doing is to themselves. You're not comfortable. You're not safe. You know, you've got a gun everywhere because you're worried about somebody coming and doing to you what your you know, folks have done to others. Just yeah. love, just be yeah. just, you know, and especially, especially in the name of Christ, in the name yeah. of Jesus. Like yeah. the call is to love, not love. to judge, not to oppress, not to yeah. discriminate. The call is to love. It's very basic, very simple. Um, but back to you. Let's let's run this resume real quick, because you are accomplished. A four-time Olympic gold medalist in track and field. There was another medal, which and a medal is a medal is a medal. So I'm going to mention that you have another one too. But it wasn't gold, but it's another one. Um, a six-time world champion, a 400-meter American record holder, three-time author, a founder and co-owner of Mommy Nation, which we're going to get into in a minute, a sports analyst and commentator for NBC. You were a host on TV on Central Ave. And, and and now a housewife. Now, I mean, with all those accomplishments, I mean, I'm literally in awe of those accomplishments. That's a, that's a lot. Uh, and, and you've done it all with this grace, with this humility, and, and you've been respectful and amazing throughout your career. But I have a very real but respectful question. Sure. Given your track record, mm -hmm. given all your achievements in your career trajectory, mm -hmm. girl, why housewives? <laughs> I didn't know you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I need to know. And right. I think people need to know. So now, and I think, and I think it's a fair question, you know, yeah. because I too asked myself, you know, like it wasn't something that I did lightly, mm -hmm. um, you know. But to be honest, the the starting point for me is I, I always say yes to life. That's the first thing. When opportunities come, I say yes, mm -hmm. and then I figure it out. And if things happen easily and they flow, then I feel like they're meant for me, right? Because I feel like you know this is an opportunity that God has brought to me. And so, you know, to be very honest, real and raw with you, Ricky, you know, there is really no blueprint for an Olympic champion after retirement. You know what I mean? That's like, real. it's like, yeah, you, you know, you, you, you give your life, your heart to something for 30 plus years, and then it just comes to an end. Um, and, you know, I think most people would be hard pressed to name an Olympic champion. What are they doing now? Like what, like name an Olympic track and field gold medalist. Tell me what they're doing now. Yeah. And so, you know, it is, it's not easy to, to figure out how you're going to make your mark next, what opportunity is going to come next to you. And so to me, to work is to be blessed. And so, you know, I thought, um, I've, I've watched the housewives for a long time. I'm not a big reality girl either, but the housewives has always been a show that I enjoy. Um, mm -hmm. I know that it's a very iconic and important part of pop culture. And so the truth is <laughs> I wanted to show up on the show is what I want to see on the show, right? Like I want to see positive uh, individuals with beautiful families and great work ethic and all those things. And so when the opportunity came, I said, I'm going to show up as me in that space. Like I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take up space and I'm going to, and I'm going to do and do it my way. And so, you know, the truth is they came and asked me if I would join it the first year. It didn't work out. I wasn't 
moved to Atlanta say I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it. And mm -hmm. then they came back a second time and I was like, you know what, I think we're going to move here. And I think this would be a great opportunity for me to show my businesses and to just continue to grow as an individual who still feels like she hasn't even scratched the surface of all the things that she can do, you know, in her life. So it wasn't a, it wasn't like a, a whimsical or like not thought out decision. It was something that I was very prayerful about and very grateful for. And, you know, as I continue to evolve on the show, I think that people will get to see more of who I am and what I bring to the table. Um, and, you know, I think it will all make sense soon. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that answer makes sense. And you and you are very similar uh, in many ways to what Ebony K. Williams says about why she chose to do Housewives of New York. The show. I actually, she was one of the people that I talked to um, because I really respected her. And when I saw that she joined the platform and she was very encouraging of me joining the platform. Um, so like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't like a just whimsical decision. It was something I was very thoughtful about and spoke to a few people who I respected about. And, you know, they also encouraged me to join as well. You know, what I love about this. First of all, I love you guys had sound amazing, well thought out, well conceived reasons for why you did it. Secondly, I love the sisterhood that you call another dynamic, amazing sister who I'm also going to be talking to, by the way. Uh, and it, it just, it's, it's great to see because, you know, again, the narrative that quite often we get in these shows is yeah. pitting black women against each other. And that's one of the challenges I have uh, with some of these shows sometimes. But this is a perfect example of the opposite of that. And it's yeah. good. I wanted to unearth that and wanted to share that with people. So I'm glad you were so honest and, and open with that. What was it like convincing? Did you have to convince Ross to do it? Oh. it was... <laughs> a lot of convincing, a lot of good loving. <laughs> Ross was not on board at first, um, you know, and he, um, I think his big fear was just, you know, obviously there is this history of, you know, relationships not making it, you know, on mm -hmm. reality television. And so um, there's nothing more important to both of us than our marriage um, and our family. And so, you know, I, you know, I had to, you know, <laughs> get him on board. Um, you know, I told him, I said, you know, the truth is that we have such a strong foundation. We've been together for 20 years mm -hmm. and um, I don't feel like there's anything we can't accomplish together. And so, you know, his biggest thing was he just did not want to have to act or not be himself he didn't want any create, you know, fake drama. And yeah. so I think that for the most part, they did a really good job of that, except for when he had to stand up for me on one of the shows when they was making some fake drama. <laughs> he didn't like that. Maybe um, he was not having it. And I love that. I love that. I love that about him and I love that about you guys and your relationship. That's one of the things I know, you know, from the outside looking in, you never know what anyone's complete story is. But the little bit that I've seen on the show, as well as in other conversations you've had with people on podcasts and such, you guys are two amazing human beings and Black people who truly were fortunate to find each other and love yeah. each other. I mean, you yeah. are clearly his queen and he's clearly your king. I mean, I love it. I love it. Yeah, he's, I feel Ricky so blessed um, to have him in my life. Like, he is just an amazing man and he just loves unconditionally and deeply. And um, we've been through a lot, you know, we've been through a lot. And um, the one thing that has remained constant is his love for me. So I'm very, very grateful. And um, I'm, I'm so appreciative that he honored my desire to do this because obviously, you know, in relationships, you gotta, you know, you gotta compromise. Like, you know, it could have gone either way. I could have said, okay, you know, if he didn't want to do it that badly, we wouldn't have done it. But I'm just so grateful that he was like, okay, we'll give it a shot, you know, and, um, and it's been good for us. This season is even better. It's even better yeah. for us. I'm excited about it. Yeah, that's great. Um, what's your experience been like on the show so far? You feel like it's been a positive, uplifting experience for you? Yeah, you know, the, the, the first season, I didn't really know what to expect. And <laughs> it's funny because I like doing things where I feel like I'm being stretched and my heart's beating out of my chest, like I'm on the start line of the 400 at the Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> this took it to another level. <laughs> <laughs> You're out of your comfort zone completely. No comfort zone here. No, not at all. And it's funny because I feel like I was born to run. So that came, even though it was a challenge and, mm -hmm. you know, like obviously it's, it's, you know, your heart's on the line when you're stepping on that line and you only have one chance to win gold in, you know, four more years, all that. So that, but I feel like I was made for that. This, I'm like, okay, having to adjust a little bit. Like, okay, how am I, how am I going to win in this space? But um, first season was tough because I'm going on to this very well established show with women who have long-standing relationships and who have big personalities. And, you know, I'm coming in trying to like, you know, 
be myself and get to know the ladies authentically and all that stuff. And so, you know, there were a bit, a few pitfalls on the first season where I kind of learned my, le- my lessons. Um, cause you know, it's trial by fire <laughs> on the mm-hmm. house side. People think it's not scripted. They do not cut and start over. Like, you know, obviously I think what m- brings attention on the show is you're having these conversations and you're having all these things happening. And then the realization that something happened and it's on camera, like, you know, it, it makes people, right. you know, like you're, you're obviously going to respond a certain way because you don't want other people to, you know, so that's what makes it a heightened, you know, kind of social experiment. I always say it's like a social experiment of women who have big personalities, bravado, all this stuff, see if they can be friends, you know, all hell is going to break loose. <laughs> and it so, definitely breaks loose. You know, I had a moment you sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, okay. I had a moment. You guys in Marlo's event, and y'all went and talked to Marlo about what everybody was talking about. I'm like, nah, Sonia, I know. Are you going to be that girl? Like, really? <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Matthew, why you got me talking to the? He's like, keep watching, keep, keep watching. watching. Keep Keep watching, you know, and that, the, you know, the, those are some of the moments that are tough because obviously you got to keep the conversation moving along, you know, and so it's really hard because, you know, obviously if you never tell them, then they only see it when the show airs. So there's no comments about it. So I, that's, those are parts of things I also learned, you know, as being a part of the show is like, how do you authentically navigate relationships? Because in real life, girls do that, right? Like if I'm on the mm-hmm. phone and my girl, I'm like, girl, you know, like this, that's how it works. It's just tricky when it's on camera because <laughs> yeah. it can definitely come off some kind of way i mean i'm sitting here talking to you everything i've read about you all the other times i've seen you like this doesn't seem like it's in her character but i saw what i saw what, what the- <laughs> <laughs> what's going on yeah. Grace, keep watching keep watching <laughs> yeah no it's all good i i i can vouch for you 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 stand up kind of sister uh you you talked about you and ross have, have been through a lot i know you have talked about it in a few you know a couple of places but my listeners may not know tell us about how you guys met how this fairy tale romance kind of began sure so we met um freshman year in college at the university of texas and um, I was actually in the dining hall and he walked in and I was like, ooh, he's kind of cute. And so I called him over and it was so funny because Ricky, when he told me his name, it was my ex-boyfriend's name. And I was like, oh no, um, Aaron's not going to work. Thank you, but no thanks. And so I kind of like, you know, dismissed them. And, um, and a week later, he got my phone number from my sister's friend and um, we were on our first date and we were like literally inseparable um, after that. Like, and, and, and our first date, we went to church and it was just, you know, he's, like I said, he's just such a great human being. And, you know, I, I feel very fortunate that I met him so early in my life because we've grown together so much. My husband went on to play in the NFL, won two Super Bowl rings. I got oh, I him. know. I'm a Giants fan, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and tell him I said thank you. And yeah. 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 That so undefeated yeah. Patriots thing, I could not have lived through that. I'm so <laughs> glad we beat the Patriots. Like I could, oh. And, and, you know, I always say, I think my husband literally tried to give me three heart attacks because in his three, when he, they also won the national championship at UT and every single game they win in like the last five seconds. I'm like, can y'all seal the deal earlier? <laughs> like, you're going to give us a heart attack. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Was he on the team that beat Southern California? Yes, with Vince Young. Yes, that was his national championship team too at UT. Oh, but are you, I feel like that one hurt you. I feel like you didn't. Broke my entire heart. I'm a Reggie Bush, Southern Cal guy. Oh, well, he made yeah. up to you in the Giants. Yeah, he did. He did. Oh my God, I didn't realize that. Somehow I missed that. It was all Vince. It was the Vince Young show. Although yeah, they had a great game all around. So. Yeah, no. my husband was a starter on the defensive side of the football and that was a game. That's, that's, that's really dope. Now you also, you know, you guys had some, you had some trying times uh, and, and, and one of the the most significant ones, and I really want to touch base on this a little bit briefly because it's such a, a, a conversation in our culture right now. It's in our politics is women's reproductive rights. And you've been very candid and, and forthright about the fact that you had, had an abortion and, and the reasons why would you share a little bit about that? So people can kind of get the human face and all these things, right? You know, it's like as a as a human being, as a man, of course I care about life and all this form, including fetuses. But yeah. that story's far more complex than that. So share yeah. a little bit for us if you could. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, you know, and it's still a really tough uh topic to talk about because it's so personal and it's like, you know, it's 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 such a tough decision to make. And I think up until that point in my life, 
I always felt like things were just black and white, mm -hmm. you know? And for the first time in my life, things got gray. You know, it was like, whatever choice I make, I, you know, I wasn't sure which choice was gonna be the right choice for me. Um, Ross and I were engaged at the time. Um, we, it was um, 2000, right before 2008, so we were engaged for a year or so. I knew he was gonna be my husband. We wanted to start a family, but you know, we, we weren't ready. We weren't ready to be parents. Um, I wanted to become an Olympic champion since I was nine years old. And so, you know, I think it's important to also share this part of the story too, because it, it you know, it, it's real. Like when we, I was in college, I had just finished college. Ross was actually, had just graduated in 2007. And, um, and as young female athletes, we always thought that when we were at our fittest, that we, you know, you, you wouldn't get pregnant. Like that was just what we always believed. Like you got zero body fat, like all of these rumors that weren't true, right? When you don't have people who are, you know, pouring into you, you know, all the real things, sometimes that lack of education and that miseducation, you know, puts you in tough situations. So and for those listening, that's why you need to teach these things in school, because yeah. not every child is getting access to yeah. scientific information right. about Absolutely. their bodies and the potential consequences of actions. Sorry to yeah. interrupt, but I think that's important because people. No, it's very important. It's so important. And, um, and we, you know, you learn so many things that you never use again in your life when you're in school. And mm -hmm. so why not focus on the things that really matter? And so yeah. I think that that's a, a really important point. So, so yeah, so I was shocked um, to learn that I was pregnant right before I was leaving for the Olympics. And also too, as a female athlete too, you take birth control, you put on weight and I had really bad experience with birth. So it's just all of these things that as a woman you're dealing with, mm -hmm. um, especially as a young woman with, you know, goals and big dreams. So to make a super long story short, um, I had an abortion the day before I boarded my flight to go to Beijing um, for the 2008 Olympics. My and goodness. I didn't, only people that knew was my sister, my mom, and my, and my now husband, but my fiance at the time. I didn't tell my dad, who was my like number one. Like this was my manager, like came to all my practices. Like that, like my best friend, like he's like leading team SRR. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I didn't tell my coach. And, you know, when you have an abortion, you're supposed to take 14 days off to physically recover. And I'm on a plane at practice the next day. I, I don't want to tell my coach, right? Like what happened? And so there was that physical impact, um, the emotional impact and the spiritual impact yeah. of, you know, making a decision that I never thought I would make. I always thought like, you know, you, you know, I'll do certain things, but I'll never, ever do something like that. Um, and so I really struggled with that, Ricky. Like I, you know, I stood on the line in Beijing. I just didn't feel worthy of, of being an Olympic champion that day. I felt like I um, had stepped outside of who I wanted to be um, mm -hmm. as a Christian woman, as, you know, as a woman. And, um, and I, I don't ever want to take anything away from Christina Rugu, who ran a great race that day. But, you know, in some ways, I feel like I just wasn't able to go out and give my best because I was so broken um, by that choice that I made yeah. um, to not have my child. So... You know, it's really difficult and you hear a lot of conversations, but the truth is, is that I've never seen or talked to a woman in a clinic who wanted to be there. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not a choice that we want to make. It's a lot of times a choice that we feel like we have to make. Um, and I have a lot of compassion for women who find themselves in difficult situations for whatever reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's fair for anybody else to have an opinion. I think that's something that she has to go through with her family, her, you know, God, her, her partner, um, because it, it can be, uh, you know, the toughest. And herself. Like, and herself. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you, you live with it. Yeah, exactly. No, you're right. It's, it, it's a profoundly difficult and, and complicated set of circumstances. And yeah. it's so challenging for me to watch people who will never have to have that experience right. men yep. have such opinions about what women can and should or shouldn't do Absolutely. with their bodies. Absolutely. I had to show up for not one, but two of my friends in their lifetimes to walk them through those moments, to talk about the pros, the cons, the, yeah. how are you going to feel? What does this really mean? Um, but what is best for you? Is it good for your health? You know, all the things and, and watch them struggle with those decisions. And, and they were very difficult. And you're right. I don't think anyone is in a clinic, you know, no one's in a clinic <laughs> laughing and talking like, okay, I'm going to do this and get back to my life. Like it's a very deep, personal, spiritual, uh, emotional uh, decision. And it's one that doesn't go away when the act yeah. is done. And so 
I applaud you for being so courageous and honest about sharing it. And that's one of the reasons why you're just an amazing guest because you live and you walk in your authenticity. And I was curious, I was curious how that affected you as a, a person of faith and then yeah. all the things that that means as well. Yeah, um, I, um, I would love to um, kind of share the end of that story because mm -hmm. it does wrapped up in my faith, you know? And so after I lost and, and won the bronze, I, it took me a long time to say I won a bronze medal that night because I felt like I lost the goal that I, you know, I was undefeated that season, ranked number one, the biggest upset of the night. Um, and I remember um, when I won the bronze medal that night, feeling like I was literally lost emotionally, spiritually, and physically. And um, I remember just um, wanting to go see my family, right? Because you can imagine the Olympics, we're yeah. in the village with all the athletes. Like you go back and it's like, you know, like that's where we live for the two weeks. And I was like, I can't go back and have to answer all these questions of what happened, all this stuff. So I get on a bus to go see my family. So see my mom and my, my sister, my husband wasn't able to come because he was in training camp and stuff. So he wasn't there. Um, and so I get on the bus and I'm, I'm crying so hard, Ricky, because I'm so hurt by everything that's going on that I get on the wrong bus and I end up literally in the middle of Beijing, China, where I obviously don't speak the language, don't know where I am. And I feel this, you know, feeling, like I tell you, of being so lost. Mm -hmm. And I literally feel the loving arms of God just like wrap his arms around me, like in the middle of Beijing. And he said to me, you're forgiven. And I don't care what anybody says mm -hmm. <laughs> about God, Jesus, whoever, he is real. I, it, it was this, it was this, this beautiful feeling of understanding that God's love for us is is nothing that we understand like you can't earn it it's just given to us freely and you know I, he would in that moment i felt like he had forgiven me was helping to forgive myself mm -hmm. and i remember um stepping on the track three days later for the four by four relay and we were behind the russian team and i was able to overhaul the russian and win gold and that just always has been a picture for me of you know the fact that in life you get beat down and you have you know very difficult moments but we can still be victorious in God, like in Jesus, you can still find victory mm -hmm. and he doesn't want the worst from you. You're not defined by your worst decisions, right? Like you still have redemption, all these things. So yeah, that's kind of, you know, for me, like the, the, the picture of God's love for me that I'll never let go of, um, yeah. and, you know, help me to see, to start to, to work my way through the shame and disappointment, all those things that you feel when you make a poor choice. Yeah, well, or or a difficult choice because poor is a, poor is a judgment, but it was it was a difficult choice. Um, that was a beautiful, beautiful story. I mean, look at the beauty that came out of that. You know, yeah. do you know that God would have shown up and spoken directly to you? I've had the same kind of experience for different reasons, yeah. and there's nothing like it. You know, before then, there's there's faith, there's this right. notion of God somebody gave you, but when you experience the presence of God the way you described yeah. and the way I've experienced, it is literally transformative. Um, and it's, it's a reminder of the importance and the power of love. And, you know, I think people use the word love a lot, but people don't really think about what it really means. Or we don't have a shared definition of what love is. And uh, I was reading Bell Hooks and she shared this definition of love that she got from M. Scott Peck, who wrote the book, The Road Less Traveled. And his definition was uh, love is the will to make oneself available for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another spiritual growth that love is an intention and an action. We wow. don't choose to love. I mean, we don't just fall in love or fall to love. We choose to love and you have to continue to act uh, in, in loving ways. And so when people talk about, you know, loving God or being Christians or whatever, but then they're acting in unloving ways, right. there's an immediate disconnect for me. How can you be so judgmental, so oppressive, so evil, so dark, so oppressive, uh, when you say that you follow the one who says that we should love. So you are a shining example of what, of what love looks like. And, and look, you were blessed with another yeah. child and yeah. being a mommy is clearly important to you. I watched you on the show and I see you talking about it. Talk to me about how motherhood has transformed you and yeah. you can go right on into mommy nation and, and what that sure. means to you. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Ricky. And thank you. Um, I just, yeah, it's, it's, it's a treat to hear your take on, so many of the questions that you've asked. So I really appreciate that. Um, Thank you. But motherhood um, is by far the, the most rewarding and beautiful um, role that I get to play. And I am very grateful that I have had the opportunity to be a mom because there was a little bit where, you know, Ross and I weren't sure. Like, you know, you, 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 you question if you'll be able to experience that, you know. Um, and so 
being a mom has just been the joy of my life and my son has been um, the richest blessing. And I think in many ways, like what you've talked about, the theme of this show is like, you think you know what love is. <laughs> you think you know how to love until you have this little human being who can do no wrong, who no matter how hard it is, you know, like up all night or they're not feeling well and you're the, lo the love is like this will, it just wills you forward. And so, um, yeah, my son has definitely, you know, changed me at the core and opened up uh, a part of love in me I didn't even know existed. And I know a lot of our parents can relate to that. Um, and, you know, because of, of my experience in motherhood, I, I, I formed an organization uh, four years ago now called Mommy Nation. Mm -hmm. And um, I created Mommy Nation because although I wanted to be a mom and I had the resources and support, motherhood was still challenging for me. You know, um, and um, I feel like it's you, you're always, you know, you always have a little human there, but it can feel very lonely yeah. if your experiences don't line up exactly like your moms or your sisters or whoever are the other kind of mom role models in your life. And so I created this community because I wanted specifically for black women, especially to feel in community, to feel connected, to feel like they weren't alone. And when I launched this community, Ricky, it was right before uh, COVID happened right before the social uprising and George mm -hmm. Floyd, all the things were happening. And I realized that being a black mother in America was a very unique experience. Um, and so, you know, there are many causes that we kind of champion. One of them most importantly being, you know, our efforts towards eradicating the black maternal mortality rate where black women are three to four times more likely to die than white, white women due to pregnancy complications. And, um, and so, you know, that's my passion. Like, I really, 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 if there's a legacy I can leave far beyond track or anything like that, it's, I really want to make an impact in improving the experiences of Black mothers all over the world, um, you know, improving their outcomes in, in, in pregnancy and birth, um, and then improving their experiences um, as moms. So I'm really, really proud of what we've done so far in four years and hopeful of, you know, all the work that we will continue to do. Well, we thank you for doing that work because it's really important work. And a, a dear friend of mine, uh, one of my pastors, Reverend Alicia Gordon, who's uh, based here in New York but works in Atlanta as well, has a uh, a complimentary uh, organization she formed called The Current Project, and they focus on helping single Black moms with all the challenging uh, challenges of that. So I'd love to introduce you guys, I and mean, maybe there's some work that you guys can collaborate on together. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. And help people out. Yeah, because she talks about, you know, uh, you know, how people need help and don't always ask for it and things that I wish I'd known earlier. I mean, I look at all the ways that I probably didn't show up for my sister and that I thought I was showing up, but there's other ways I could have shown up if I'd known better. And so I just think it's so important to, to share these stories and to have these conversations so that people can know what's uh, necessary and know what people's yeah. challenges are. And we can show up for each other and, and, and build that beloved community everybody likes to talk about, but we can actually maybe yeah do the work uh, right. to build it. And one last thing, you know, you touched on what parenthood does for you, what being a mom does for you. I've watched it with so many of my friends. Uh, I've watched it with myself. I'm like a dad to a few people, not a biological dad, but a dad to a few people. And yeah. it does this thing where there's this love that resides, and I believe inside of all of us, but if we can get past our fear, we can get past the challenge, we can get past the trauma that we've experienced, we can tap into that yeah. love. And parenthood kind of is a window, a, a, yeah. a gateway to that for so many people. And I think if parents could take that and you guys can share with us what that feels like and maybe inspire people who aren't parents to find that space, find that love yeah. inside them, that that's yeah. another gift that uh, you can give to the world. Because I, I, I really do believe everybody has it in them somewhere, even the coldest, darkest heart. It's in there somewhere. It's just, you know, protecting itself from all the pain and trauma that it's experienced in the past. Sandra, this has been great. I mean, Sonia, this has been great. Um, I am grateful for you coming. What is next for you? I want to know that because I know you got something cooking. I don't know what it is, but I know you got something else cooking. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I am um, so obviously the Real Housewives of Atlanta, when you hear this conversation, will be airing. So I hope that you'll tune in and support the show. Um, I still commentate for NBC. So every weekend there's a big track meet on TV. Tune in to, to hear me and my colleagues, you know, really pouring into the athletes and, and highlighting the great things that they're doing on the track. Um, I work with Nike as a brand ambassador. So I do a lot of great things with them. 
um, and iFit as well. Um, I'm also launching a new line at the end of the season. Um, I don't want to give it away, but it's something that I'm very passionate about that's very on brand for me. It's, it's about family. It'll be launching the end of 2023. Every family can get one, so hopefully you guys will. <laughs> me? See, I knew something was in the works. I knew it. <laughs> And I'm really, really excited about it. It's coming along really, really well. Um, and then, you know, like I said, like I, I, I love, I love hosting. I love public speaking, all that kind of stuff. So hoping to do more of that um, in the future. Um, and then, you know, my big goal is to like, you know, one day, Good Morning America, The View, like, you know, that's where, that's where I'm headed, Ricky. That's where I'm all right. headed. <laughs> all right, y'all, y'all hear that, producers? Y'all hear that? Good Morning America, <laughs> The View, or maybe her own show. Let's get it, y'all. Uh, let's get it. I appreciate you. Uh, if you need a photographer for any of those things, give me a holler. But uh, I'm thinking we should be co-hosting a show because you are, you know, this has been phenomenal. Like seriously, one of the best um, interviews I've had. So I really, really appreciate your thoughtfulness and, you know, just what you're doing, the work that you're doing. I could feel your love and passion. Um, and I, I know your audience does too. So thank you so much for doing what you do and for having me on. That was really, really kind of you. Thank you. Uh, I, I do my best. That's all we can do, right? We use our gifts yep. to serve other people. That is how I live. That That's all that matters. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I want you to drop your social media and your website uh, for us so we can make, and I'll put it in the show notes as well, but I want people to be able to find you and be able to support your efforts. Yes, please. So you can follow me individually on all social platforms at Sonya, S-A-N-Y-A, Richie, R-I-C-H-I, Ross, R-O-S-S. So that's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all the places. Um, and then Mommy Nation. Uh, we are on Instagram, M-O-M-M-I. N-A-T-I-O-N, Mommy Nation. We're on Instagram. And of course, you can follow our blog, uh, which is super important to us. We have over a thousand blogs written by incredible Black moms, by educators, by leaders, just celebrities. All kinds of people have contributed to our resource. Um, and then we do really cool events too, which you can learn all about on our Instagram and our website as well. Well, that was a lot. That was a lot. And you guys follow her and support her because she's out here doing the work and she's making it, making it do what it do. Tell Ross that we say we appreciate him for being a great example of a king loving his queen. Uh, and thanks again for winning them Super Bowls because I could not have taken <laughs> <laughs> that's what it. That's, that's, that's my dude right there. Um, but I appreciate you uh, all as well in the world when you are doing the kinds of things that you're doing. So we are really, really grateful for you. And I thank you again for coming on because what we're trying to do here is change the world, make the world a little bit better place, one conversation at a time. And this is definitely a great start to our fourth season. So thank you so much. And uh, keep doing everything you do. I'm going to keep doing what I do for love and blackness. <laughs> thank you, Sonia Richards-Ross.